Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks by the New Art School. Our guest today is Justus Deinert. Welcome, Justus. Hey, thanks for inviting me. I'm curious about this talk. It's a real pleasure to have you here. So tell us about you and your fantastic work. Well, this is, uh, I'm getting old and it's not so easy to understand where to start. But actually, my interest in design education uh, came from my studies. So when I studied uh, industrial design at the academy, uh, Art Academy in Stuttgart, um, I had the feeling that's, that's not all. There must be more than that. Um, so I uh, actually, I tried to get a scholarship, uh, which I got finally. And so my, uh, my idea was to travel Europe and visit all the important design schools in Europe and make a kind of a short field inquiry uh, of what design education is. And luckily, I was able to travel for one year um, and visit too many universities to, to, to mention here. And ever since, <clears throat> it was my, uh, well, yeah, my main interest. Okay, so, uh, but, but you, you studied, you, you, you studied uh, what exactly? I studied industrial design mm -hmm. and I worked as an industrial designer for quite a long time. So I, I try to um, experience every, uh, how to say, every context which you can imagine. So I had my own studio for five or six years. I worked with industry like Mercedes-Benz for three years. So I tried actually all kinds of uh, contexts and it was amazing. Uh, so I did from investment goods, machinery design, uh, color design, interior. And so that's one of the uh, amazing facts of our profession that you actually can step into different fields whenever you feel. The best, the longest um, period was actually furnished, uh, furniture design. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, what, what exactly? Any, any particular piece of furniture? Well, it was mainly office furniture, hmm. uh, office seats and tables and systems. And that was, uh, yeah, interesting and challenging. At the same time, it was furniture is very close to interior design. So I did quite some interesting projects with the German railway, um, a five star traveling train, which never came into realization. So it was, yeah, uh, but it was a nice project to follow. Fantastic. So tell us about how you got into teaching. Well, I was always interested in teaching ever since I left uh, university. And actually, I started teaching in the context of art mm -hmm. because friends of mine uh, founded a very special kind of private art school. And once that was founded, it developed. And so step by step it became uh, bigger and we found a new campus. And then I was asked to, to step in there. And it was actually a, the idea of applied arts, but not in a historic way, but in a contemporary way. Uh, all the, the students had to do uh, internships in industry as artists, and they had to cope with the challenges. How, how do I act as an artist in industry? It was a very good school. It doesn't exist anymore because after that was Ooh, 25 years ago, yeah. um, and it closed down about five years ago oh. because of political reasons. Uh, the problem was that it, uh, that Jürgen, who was running the school, actually, uh, he wanted to have an official state, how to say? Um, certificate. Certificate, yes. Yeah. And then we had to change to a bachelor program and we mm -hmm. had um, uh, auditing and things like that. And so that killed actually the school. But there was no, <laughs> there was no other way because the system is like that, you know. So Germany is not a good, uh, is not a good uh, environment for private schools, not at all. Oh. Because the, the higher education is free. You don't have yes. to pay for your studies. Yes. So how would you survive as an art school? It's so almost what, impossible. This is very interesting. So what's, what changes were you forced to, 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 to do? Pardon? This is very interesting. What, what changes were you forced to do? Oh, it was 
only formal things like how many books are in the library if it's not enough <laughs> you you don't right. get the stamp it's just formal things um, so the spirit of of the institution didn't matter at all it was just the formal okay but but just about the books or, or anything about the, no, the hours it was, or it, yeah it was the program it was the stuff it was a kind of uh the teaching environment it was uh, almost everything uh, i think they actually they had the idea to kill private schools so the uh -huh. the bologna um process pro process yeah. in germany had yeah. actually two focuses to um, reduce the study times to three years for a bachelor uh -huh. so in germany a bachelor is always three years that that's the reason why at our university, we still have a German diploma, which is a four-year program. Mm -hmm. We are the only one, actually. And the other one was uh, to get rid of private schools. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. That's politics, yes. So, so what happened after that? So after that, so actually, I, I was teaching and I was involved at that school only for five years. That was mm -hmm. during my... Uh, time at Mercedes-Benz and uh, another important um, step was actually traveling to China uh, for many reasons, for many reasons. Um, I was actually forced to travel to China. I didn't intend to do so. It was 1997. So I was assistant professor at the Stuttgart Academy and my boss intended to travel to China with 20 students and I should take care of 20 students in Beijing, which was not my favorite waste of time. So I, I said, no, I, I wouldn't do that. So my colleague, she wanted to do it, but she became pregnant. So I was, and she didn't want to fly a long haul flight mm. uh, um, due to the radiation. So I was forced to, um, to travel to Beijing. And the funny thing happened when I opened well, I, when I smelled the air in Beijing, it was like walking down the stairs from the plane. There was uh, uh, no, uh, no, kind of how to say, contemporary airport at that time. Mm. And when I smelled it, I flew at home the first time in my life. It, so it, it was a, a very, very interesting, no, it was a, a life-changing moment. It was, yes. So I don't know what the reason why, but ever since I uh, traveled to China quite often, and uh, China, we, we, we can talk about the Chinese um, spirit, philosophy, background. And the other fact was that China was developing in terms of design at that time. Mm. So late 90s, 20s. So there were brilliant conferences. So I had all the colleagues from all over the world um, came to China and we had the conferences there. It was a... a the best school I could imagine. So uh, to talk to my colleagues there. And step by step, I got deeper into Chinese philosophy and Chinese thinking and Asian thinking. And I learned a lot for the, uh, not only design education, but for uh, a different kind of thinking, which could be helpful to develop new ideas. Mm -hmm. And so that was my main uh, interest then and ever since ever when I had my sabbatical which is in Germany every four years so I spent that time in, in China so and normally it was like th three months a year in China um, and another uh, connection that to Andrew because he has kind of the same experience with his Chinese background mm. so um the beginning of my Chinese travels, they were very interesting because there were no professors for design. They hadn't been educated at that time. They, in, the, in communication design, it was artists. Mm. Well, and in industrial design, it was whatever. It was some feng shui landscape architects. Mm. Uh, so they had to put someone in the position. That was amazing to talk to, to those people who had very um, high expertise and competence in their field. And 10 years later, it changed. So the first educated designers who were educated in China uh, came into these positions. And that was a bit boring. 
in fact, because there are two, there were two strong, um, how to say, um, developments in design education. The one, uh, the way it started in Wuxi was very much influenced by Japanese industrial design education and others were influenced by German design education. There was actually not so much a British uh, influence in the beginning. Mm -hmm. so, and so these were kind of competing Japanese way and the, and the German way. Uh, as I am very critical to the German way for two reasons, uh, which we can talk about. It's uh, the Bauhaus problem and the Ulm problem. Um, uh, I was more interested, not exactly in the Japanese way, because that was very formal and very um, pseudo statistical and scientific. It was not a, an, an interesting approach. So the, the experiment which I try to establish every time I travel to Chinese universities is to find with colleagues a new way of, of teaching. Uh, so I refused actually to present a standard German uh, education way. And that led to very um, curious situations, in fact. So I remember when I was holding a, a, a talk for master students at the Tsinghua University in Beijing, very early, it was 20, 2000 or something like that. I criticized the Barcelona chair of Mies van der Rohe. So I explained why this chair is a very important design piece that, that does not fit any, uh, that not, uh, does, it doesn't match any criteria of good design because mm -hmm. it's too heavy and too large and, and things like that. So, and so that made all the students at Tsinghua University curious. So, and mm -hmm. so the bachelor students, they insisted to take part in this, um, uh, in this lecture, and it was quite a um, it was quite a message, <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah. So you mentioned something very. What is the standard German way you mentioned? Well, the the history. Is, so we have two um, overvaluated schools in Germany, which is the Bauhaus and the Ulm School of Design. Yeah, um, and that is. Uh, the, the reason for it is the Second World War and the reform, the higher education reform in Germany. So uh, let's start with the Bauhaus. Uh, Bauhaus in the beginning was um, an art school with a strong emphasis on crafts. Mm -hmm. There was no industrial idea in the beginning in Weimar. And so, but this school had to survive the same way the private school had to survive where I was working in. So they changed uh, their location from Weimar to, uh, to Dessau. And Dessau was supported, financially supported by Junkers, who was, that was the company um, building the airplanes at that mm -hmm. time. So they had an interest to, to uh, force design into the industrial direction. Um, that's not a problem in itself, but the problem actually occurred after the Second World War. So in Germany, uh, all the schools had been closed and you had to find new stuff, stuff which is not, um, uh, how to say, this, the idea was uh, to have new stuff which was not involved into the Nazi regime, right? So, and the Bauhaus was closed during Nazi time. It was not exactly closed by the Nazis. That's um, another narrative, which I don't like. Uh, but anyway, after the Second World War, every school uh, hired actually Bauhaus students. Mm -hmm. So we had a, all over Germany, we had a unified idea of, um, of how to teach design. And that was a problem because there had been many developments which are from Jugendstil, from other uh, backgrounds, which were extremely important and actually led to the Bauhaus uh, concept. Uh, but that was actually completely um, erased. There was nothing of that. And so everyone believed in Bauhaus and some of the teachers were good. 
there were students of the Bauhaus who were not good teachers and maybe they didn't study more than half a year in Bauhaus. So many things like that. So, but finally in 1971, uh, the um, higher education reform in Germany took place. Uh, 1970 started 69. And so the, all the uh, design schools had to deliver a contemporary uh, a modern program. And those schools, which were called the Werkkunstschule at that time, um, they had to survive. And by, what did they do? They copied the Ulm program because that was actually the most advanced program at that time. So they, we are exactly like Ulm, so please let us survive. And so these schools survived. And as the Ulm school closed in 1968, there were many students, teachers available. So again, Germany was flooded by a single concept of a design teaching. And that is the big problem. So Germany has these two historical uh, impacts uh, that there was no real differentiation in design. And what is the education. main difference between these two, two systems? What is what what makes them different? So the uh, which, the Ohm, what is what is the Ohm system different different? Oh, the Ohm system started with the idea to um, bring more scientific um, ideas into design education, which is not a problem in itself, um, but it was a very, well, it was an experiment. It um, took many people, uh, Ulm was a, a perfect experiment. And uh, when other schools copied the program, there was no experiment anymore. They did the formal steps, you know, in education and they didn't search or uh, try to find new ways in the system. So that was, actually the problem at my university it was very much like that so and it took uh, decades to get rid of that okay okay and so, had, yes please so it's also gone you were saying <laughs> yeah to go back to um uh, to Bauhaus and also the um school there always have been other schools and very good schools. The, the one in Wuppertal, the one in Kassel was a brilliant school, Krefeld. So we had different concepts of different schools and all these concepts were forgotten. And that was the, the big problem in Germany. I think it's quite different in the UK. Mm. So you find all kinds so of- So what, what do we need to remember from, from the, from, from what schools do we need to remember? What systems do we need to, to remember again? So um, after the Second World War, there was a movement which was called the Werkkunstschule. That means actually a art-based craft school. And it's different to, it's difficult to translate that exactly. But there were many schools actually involved to set up a new kind of design attitude, thinking, responsibility, so that first ideas of ecological responsibility was actually in this context. Uh, but after the um, higher education reform, it was all cut off. Okay. So and the Ulm, Ulm School had not enough time, the concept of the Ulm School for my opinion had not the time to developed because from 1953 until 1968, it was 15 years of experiment. And then it was closed and, and it didn't continue. That's a pity. I think the concept of the potentials were fantastic, but there was, was no form uh, further development. Okay, wonderful. So to go back to your, to your path, uh... To, to your career. So you taught, uh, after the first school closed, you went to, 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 to university. Uh, yes, some years later, I went to university. That's true. And I was lucky to get the position at the Darmstadt University because it is the only one in Germany combining practical design um, 
work with the students and design theory. Mm -hmm. So normally design theory, you are either a philosopher or whatever. And so um, we don't have this combination in, in Germany too often. So I was very lucky because it matched very well my, uh, my interests. And so it was 2000 when I started there. And yes, ever since I was there, I was trying to find money to uh, publish the history of German design education. And I was lucky, like when I was at Darmstadt 2000, uh, except for seven years, it was the 100th anniversary of design education in Darmstadt. Because in Darmstadt, wow. there was the artist residence. It was the Jugendstil artist residence. And they started educating designers in uh, 1907. So in 100, 100th anniversary is always a good um, moment to, to gain money. So I went to different institutions and finally, I found enough money to publish a book, a wonderful book, which uh, because it's, yeah, the money was enough. And I had a very, very good um, assistant employed for this book. He was now my colleague and my friend in theory. And we had a lot of fun really investigating very deeply into German design education. So it's, uh, it took two years actually two years and with many pictures uh, we realized at a certain point we realized that we can actually we have access to the archives in eastern germany we find the files but we don't make sense of it because we were not socialized in in the eastern germany okay. so we had to find someone who can really read those texts it's, it's german language but you know it is completely different there are some like some formal po political layers which you can just take off. You don't have to read them, as I was told. And so we needed support from the Eastern German side, which luckily we got. And so finally, we could finish the book. Um, yes, and ever since, uh, well, yes, actually for me, the, the historic part, which was before Bauhaus, I, I was a designer. So, and, and uh, for me, design education started with Bauhaus. I learned a lot from my friend and colleague that this happened earlier. And ever since I am quite not so much in design education anymore, but a more general aesthetical education. That is mm -hmm. my, my main focus now. Mm -hmm. Wow. So tell us about this book. Is it available in English? Oh, unfortunately not. No. 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 <laughs> so so many people would like to see it uh, tr being translated into English, but it never happened. It's a okay. Yes. Yeah. So tell us some things from, from your conclusions or from your research, from, from that research. Well, the, the, the first conclusion is actually there was a, a big variety of different concepts. It was a, um, a constant progress of searching, finding new um, ways. There was this economy, uh, economy impact, like what does industry want? There was the aesthetical impact. There was artistic impact. It was a um, continuous struggle, actually. And it stopped. And it, is, it stopped, actually, with the higher education reform. There was no struggling anymore. And the worst situation was actually the, the Bologna process. That killed definitely everything. So that is my, my conclusion. So I would very much like to go back. So by struggle, you mean like effort of improving? What, what, what yeah, is that? yeah, yeah, effort of improving and um, struggling for the right attitude, mm. uh, finding people who support this attitude and um, so that's that was before actually before the Bauhaus Foundation. Um, people learned that Gropius founded the Bauhaus, which is not true. It was a very long process of um, trying to develop a concept from different um, interests, like industry, mm -hmm. like art. Uh, so and that was a lo long process, and Gropius was involved in this process. Uh, uh, at the, the last half year, I think. Uh, 
And he was quite smart to found the Bauhaus in the very moment where Bruno, uh, uh, Otto Bartning, who was actually in charge of uh, this um, development of the teaching program, he had to go to some, how to say, he was sick, so he was not in a hospital, but a, a place for recreation. I don't mm -hmm. know the word, but it's in so, a sanctuary, in a sanctuary, yeah, 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 something like that. And uh, in this very moment, Gropius founded the Bauhaus. But you had Froebel in Germany, right? You had you had Froebel. Froebel. Froebel with the kindergarten system. Ah, yes, yes. Oh, there were many. Um, uh, we had the um, this is. Um, the reform movement. Reform movement was like Feuerbe and uh, many other aspects, which was a very German, Swiss, Austrian thing, mm -hmm. the reform movement. Uh, it was like the uh, new concepts of teaching children, a new attitude towards children. So not understanding children as small uh, grown-ups or adults, uh, but uh, realize that they have their um, interests by their own, and so that influenced uh, that influenced design education very much. In fact, um, there was a project in Germany which was the Werkstatt in Hellerau, so the workshop Hellerau. Hellerau. Uh, so the the founder was a, a furniture manufacturer. His name was Schmidt, which is a very German name, and uh, he had the idea to create uh, a new way of living, working, and uh, manufacturing attitude. So he built a new factory, not too far from Dresden, uh, uh, in Hellerau. Uh, he built in the, in the woods, uh, very much related to a um, British uh, garden city concept. Uh, he built uh, for the workers, he built houses to live in the greens. He had a brilliant uh, educational program. So that was actually 19, when was it? It was 1907, something like that. Uh, so it was before Bauhaus. And he had all the, um, the most advanced educators there. Also A.S. Neal, which you might know, um, the Summer, Summer Hill School founder. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. And A.S. Neal came to Hellerau before he went to Summerhill because he was attracted by this educational, um, advanced ed educational movement. Uh, he realized then that so some of those teachers there in Hellerau were kind of too conservative. So he decided to go to Great Britain and uh, found the mm -hmm. Summerhill School. But actually it, it, that was one um, important aspect of Hellerau. So education was, very much connected to the idea of how to design environment, design your life, uh, especially in health. Dance, so dance education was a very, very big thing at that time. And also the Bauhaus had a, a stage class, a dance class, which is all lost. I don't know if there are any in Britain, uh, in Germany, I don't find any design schools with dancing. We have performing, well, we have, we have performing arts, yes, performing arts. Yeah, we have, yes. we have performing arts, but they are not related to design. There's only one school. Ah, you mean directly connected? Yeah, directly. So it's part of a design program. Wow. So this doesn't exist. Dance is part of a design program. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Yes, I do that from time to time. So I have very special invited guests. So it's design. Um, dance teachers, ah. um, which are from another long story, um, and also cooking. So these are the basic things for aesthetic education. So uh, dance, cooking, and? Dance, uh, cooking, and then un unintentional drawings. So that are the three core um, aspects I deal with. So the unintentional drawing is... Uh, a very good method, opportunity to find new, really new ideas. Because when you normally in design, in industrial design in Germany, it's like you start a project, for example, design something to sit on or whatever, and you start with a um, research investigation. So you, you research what, what does exist. And that is a big problem because in the very moment where you research the past, 
uh, then you focus your brain to the past. So everything you find is existing, it's past. So you will never be able to really have innovative ideas. So my idea is before researching, it's actually to start drawing without any intention. It's just like crickle crackle, so it's like nothing. Um, but if you have a hundred of these um, drawings and you put them on the floor, then you see certain themes, topics, and you, you change your mind to a more, um, how to say it? It, it, it is not a logical thinking, it is not a dive thinking, I'm missing the, uh, the English word for it, Asso association thinking, something okay. like that. Okay. And so your brain starts to find new things in, in abstract drawings, which you cannot make sense to. And so starting from this, uh, you can develop uh, really um, surprising and innovative uh, developments. And this actually is also very much influenced and supported by Chinese uh, Taoist uh, philosophy. So then in, in Taoism, there is this term of Wu Wei, which yes. means acting by not acting. And this is very much because in the very moment you have an intention, then you already know where to go to. So you don't discover anything. So you're, and to get rid of your intention is a very important first step. And once you have with this creative, associative um, development, you have gained an idea which can be very abstract, then it does make sense to, to research because then you know where to research. It is one example, maybe, um, because it's a bit abstract. So I did this, um, I did a project with my students in, uh, with a company, Bosch. Bosch is a car supplier company. And it was the time when the instrument clusters were changing from uh, hands to LCD screens. So Bosch asked us to can you do some design because we have to present to our clients something which is happening on the screen. And so I said, yes, it's an interesting um, challenge. And I had many team of 12 students, something like that. And one student, she was extreme in her, uh, in her attitude and in her, how to say, um, my English is, it's really the word is perfect. It's perfect. Now it's not it's better than my I, German. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't travel for three years, and that makes it a bit uh, difficult. Now she was um, she had a brilliant start actually. So she did these unintentional drawings, and she uh, saw many things like um, jellyfish and whatever, and she said, "Deep sea, deep sea. That is the key word." Actually, she had to design instrument clusters, right? Uh, but that is an idea. An idea is uh, very often not uh, related to the task you have to fulfill. You know? So the idea was deep sea, and she started uh, researching in terms of deep sea. So what happens? What kind of animals live there? What kind of uh, what happens there? And so she actually spent time, weeks and weeks and weeks, and it was kind of four, four or five weeks before presentation. And actually, I lost my confidence at that time as a teacher, and I, I tried to convince her just do something to present. So I didn't want her to fail. And she said, no, it's a deep sea. And then she designed a brilliant, um, a concept for uh, organizing information because it was actually the idea of the instrument cluster and the information coming from the depth. Because imagine if you're uh, if you're running out of gas in the beginning, it's not so much a problem. So, but then you know the more the problem is, the closer the information comes. And at the end, she had three patterns um, on her how to organize information in a three-dimensional uh, screen. It was brilliant. And that came only from the idea of deep sea. Wow. 
And if you start researching on instrument clusters, you would never come to a deep sea of course. Uh, study. So that is uh, the idea. That is a very good example. Sometimes it's uh, not so um, powerful, but what impressed me very much is that she had the certainty. She knew exactly. She said there was an inner certainty that she is on the right track. And that is, if you have a strong idea, then that happens. Fantastic. Yeah. So how do we go back to a pre-Bologna time? So how, oh. how can we force the curriculum back there? <laughs> so if it's outside Germany, private schools would be a good, mm. uh, would mm. be a good approach. Mm. Mm. In Germany, it, there's... It, it doesn't make sense. I, I talk to colleagues every now and then, and uh, uh, four or five of them would very much like to join um, for a new kind of design university. But no, it would it would not happen. I don't think so. Uh, but uh, Bologna, the idea to unify education is a, a misunderstanding in itself. Yes. So education should not be unified because education is something which is very much based on a spirit of an institution, of the attitude of the teaching staff, and the interest of the, of the students. And this can't be unified. This is almost impossible. I, so I, I visited Andrew in, in Plymouth, uh, the Red House. Have you ever been there? Yes, yes. yes. So that was a dream for me. <laughs> so this happens uh, in Great Britain when there is the right person to persuade people um, to follow this idea. And I think that the Plymouth concept is very close to an ideal as I understand it. But also now it's, it has changed. So Andrew mm -hmm. told me that this was kind of, yeah, it's, it's under a new administration now and it's very formal and uh, not this aesthetic freedom, which um, actually was the idea before. But at least it existed for, I don't know, 10 years or whatever. And, so, and that, uh, yeah, so let's hope that there will be other initiatives to follow. But, but I know the... that, sorry, and I sorry. know that Andrew was struggling. So it was all negotiating with the ministry. And so it was kind of, yeah, it, it's good that he did it, but I think it's annoying. You always have to try to convince people. So what, after you finished the book, did you start embark on any other ambitious project? Oh, yes. So I, I actually, uh, I was a trained designer. I didn't know how to write books. It was my friend Kai, uh, who, who was my, my assistant at that time. And so, but ever since I was very, uh, I became interested in publishing yes, and trying to get deeper into aesthetic education terms. And so, uh, so year after year, I published the latest one is actually on digitization and the problem of digitization, which is, a, a, yeah, it's, it's very comprehensive actually from different uh, sides and Kai and, and me, we wrote about uh, the aesthetic experience in designing. So that is the main focus uh, in the moment. So I'm not so much interested anymore in, in design practice. So I do it from time to time when, when I yeah, meet some special challenges. So mm -hmm. for example, a few years ago, I was asked to run a project of it was um, under the idea, the UNESCO program of education for sustainable development. Um, so there's a, a worldwide program of the UNESCO. And there was a project in China, which um, friends of mine who are doing, they, they create playgrounds for children and nature experience parks and things like that. And they won, so they, they actually, they were successful in getting this uh, thing, um, the project. 
And then they realized that they, they can't manage it because they had no experience with China. And then they asked me uh, if I could um, actually, if I could run the project in China. And the boss of the, the company, of this playground company, was one of the students of the private school I mentioned before. So, his, uh, so he was one of the um, students there. And then we, yeah, we, we uh, developed this playground or a nature experience path in a, on a small island um, in the south of Beijing, 300 kilometers south of Beijing. Uh, the island was for, stud for pupil students only. So they, had, they, they were able to um, explore nature um, uh, directly. And for the tourists, there was a, um, a elevated path through the nature with certain aesthetic, how to say, impact situations where the color is changing or you start hearing the nature. But they had to be very quickly to, uh, to run through the island. And I just recently, I that was with a Swiss um, landscape architect and recently I uh, was kind of in a um, nostalgic mood and I googled uh, China so I took a, a view from top and I realized that Hangzhou Island is uh, looking different now so it looks exactly right, like we designed it. Oh wow. But unfortunately it, it is opened uh, it will be opened like in the next weeks but I can't travel to China which is a pity. So that that was something I thought that that's a that, that's a funny challenge to um, to run a project like that in China. So whenever it's kind of there's more than just business in it, then I'm interested in doing it. Yes. So how can we uh, help students today with with employability with the transition of from being mm -hmm. a student to, to 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 be successful successfully employed? I think. So uh, the number one is training them to gain ideas. As I mentioned before with the deep sea. So ideas are always needed. So in every job, if you have ideas, you are on the right side. Uh, the other is to, um, to educate a critical attitude towards economics which is extremely important because we live, the, so the problems which we face now, um, climate crisis and whatever, um, is an economic problem. It is not a design problem. And what I, um, big problem I see is that we are running into a attitude of solutionism as Morozov, uh, calls it. So we think that we can solve every problem. And designers are very good in that, actually. Industrial designers. So they, they create some kind of lamps which can be recycled and things like that, but that is not the problem. The problem is that people, it's, it's the capitalist um, profit idea, which is a big problem, and it will cause more and more problems and we will not be able to solve the climate crisis. We will not be able as long as we do not um, find another net attitude in terms of economic uh, business. So I think that is extremely important to educate students in, the, uh, in economics, in ideas and um, in, well, yes, something which is like kind of self, how to say, so that, so that they, so self-confidence. So mm -hmm. that is, uh, I think that that is central. So mm -hmm. the, the confidence mm -hmm. in what you are able to do mm -hmm. and that, that you are not only someone who uh, adds a little bit of beauty to daily life, but that this beauty is essential. That's beauty is really essential. So I, it took me maybe six, six or seven years to establish the word beauty at our university. 
because no one was talking about beauty. They were talking about function and uh, responsibility and things like that, but no one talked about beauty. And beauty is our core competence, and it is extremely important, not only in a decorative way, but in a uh, beauty is a, a perfect match of different layers of a problem, of a product, of whatever. And so if this harmony occurs, so it's like with the cooking, you know, if, you, if you reach the point that everything is actually interacting, and each taste is interacting with another one, and the temperature is perfect, and the wine goes good with it, and so on, then you have this moment of beauty. Mm. And how could we live without beauty? It's um, almost impossible. And this, the idea of beauty was um, indeed very strong in the Jugendstil movement and in the early Bauhaus. And it changed, the design changed to functionalism only due to uh, where the money came from. In Dessau, the uh, airplane manufacturer Junkers they wanted a more technical approach. And so the beauty ever since is kind of, I don't know, it's better in, in Great Britain, uh, but uh, in Germany, beauty is something which you don't talk about so, mm. in design and education. And mm. another difference or another problem which came with the Ulm school concept is that we lost our, um, our relation to crafts. In Germany, we don't have really arts and crafts. It's a very poor level. You don't find arts and crafts in the museums. We have special museums like in Frankfurt. We have museums like that. But a situation like I face it from time to time in the UK is that you have art exhibition and there are craft examples as well in the exhibition, which is a perfect thing. So, and I think that that would be something to bring into design education, definitely. Crafts would, should be part of a design education. But the development is exactly opposite. It is bringing digital technology into schools, which is an even bigger problem because I don't know what it's like in, in other places in, in Europe because I'm not so informed now. But our school system in Germany is actually lacking any aesthetic quality. It's only technological um, emphasis. It is um, engineering, but there is no music, no crafts, no art. And what they teach uh, students in school in arts is ridiculous. So they, they draw actually from photos. So, and then they come to our university yeah. and we realize, okay, so what shall we do with them? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing to do. And uh, so our idea now is that we, uh, we established a, a private program or a semi-private program. It's run by the university, by our department. But the um, students have to pay for it. And they, from school, they get an intensive aesthetic art uh, education, uh, like a foundation course, but a very, a pre-foundation, because then when yeah. they enter the university, they get a uh, foundation. But that is necessary because there's such a gap uh, from school education to higher design education, which has been, to be bridged by some institutions. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you've kind of answered the next question, but you know, uh, I'll, I'll ask it anyway. I mean, if there was no limitation, mm -hmm. you know, what would you do differently? You know, what, what would you change if there, if there was you could do anything at all, in, including <laughs> going going pre Bologna? <laughs> uh, I, yes, actually, uh, I would. Uh, that's that's a dream, actually, mm. and. Uh, I would get rid of uh, any formal uh, modules of teaching mm. because teaching is a is a is a process of 
how to say it, it's a process of continuous change. It is very much also a Taoist idea of the, the, the continuous change. Uh, so modules, so fixed like this is design history, um, doesn't make sense at all. Um, and so it's, that would be the first step. Um, the next step is actually to find the right people to get involved in it. Um, because uh, I, in my, some of my friends are brilliant teachers and they would not dare to teach. They wouldn't do it because they hate universities. They hate teaching anyway, but they are brilliant teachers by, her, by their attitude. Yeah. And to have a kind of space or situation where those people can interact with students, which is not called teaching, uh, but something uh, comparable. So my, actually, I would not, uh, I would like to go before Bologna, that's right, yes, but I would actually uh, go back to the Black Mountain College. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would like to uh, restart. Black Mountain, just after Bauhaus then, yeah. Yes, yes. No, I, I, well, it was, yes. Yeah. Uh, 1935 until yeah. 60. Yeah. And the, because there we had we had the, the musicians, we had uh, the engineers, uh, we had scient scientists. That was a, a perfect concept of an idea school. Yeah. But... Oh, that, that was the time that the spirit was the right spirit and people just went there and it was enough to be at the Black Mountain College. That's, that's my guess. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So that's in a historic view, it's uh, the ideal uh, design school. Maybe the uh, Plymouth School of Art is a bit like that, especially the Red House. That's for the mm -hmm. uh, children's education is brilliant. Mm -hmm. So how can our viewers and listeners find you? Oh, uh, as I said, I am very critical about digitization. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any, uh, any website. I don't have um, anything, I'm not in social media and so on. So it's a, a bit different, uh, difficult to find me. So the best is an email. I'm, I'm very good in emailing. Okay. And, okay. and I would very appreciate to have um, people in the same, uh, spirit and attitude that we can maybe set up a network uh, on aesthetic education. That would be great. Yes. Brilliant. So would you like me to share the email? Uh, yes, you can share the email. And I'm very much ever since. Uh, so I'm, when I met um, Andrew the last time, I invited him for an anniversary of Craft Association in Germany because of this problem I mentioned that crafts are so underrepresented yeah. and Andrew uh, uh, gave a good contribution uh, to this discussion and so ever since I was I was thinking at least LinkedIn should be something I maybe I get more involved in yeah absolutely yes. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good idea okay so yeah so, so what advice would you like to leave us with don't um, how to say I don't, the English word, nicht entmutigen. No. Don't, don't lose your, um, your courage, your, uh, so even if everything is um, like Bologna is uh, a big stupidity, uh, there will be other times. Uh, there will be a time where this stupid uh, attitude will not um, be the dominant one. So it, there are, very, that there are, in fact, developments which I appreciate very much. The new European Bauhaus, have you heard about mm -hmm. that? Yes, of course. So, so that is one thing. And I said, oh, wow, they're talking about beauty. They're talking about aesthetics. Yes. And uh, my university now, it's a technical university, is involved in a EUT plus program. Mm -hmm. It's eight European universities. And these eight universities, and a, in a long term they want to merge to one university and so Darmstadt University would only be one campus of this big university and within this process of merging eight universities there is um, one 
field where I'm involved in is called Aesthetico. It's bringing aesthetic education into engineering education. And we are working on this. Um, so every university has kind of a, a group working on it. And it's very formal. It is very mm -hmm, uh, weak in the moment, but still it is, it's a good beginning, yes. Thanks. Sounds very positive. I hope so, yes. <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for an amazing conversation. And thank you. Um, looking forward to uh, you know, connecting with you again. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also Design Education Forum. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be happening in November. So again, mm -hmm. I'd like to invite you to that. And uh, we can be Definitely. Here. So the forum will be in presence, or will it be? The in forum presence? is right now. Right now, it's uh, virtual again, but we'll have more information mm -hmm. by July, I think. You know. Okay. Uh, regardless of anything, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Good. I'll take and, part. Uh, I'll be there. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for your thank initiative, you. and thank you for the great talks you um, established, and good success for that. Thanks. <laughs>